At approximately 7.45 the morning of June 5th, 1967, Israeli Defense Forces launch a preemptive strike against major fortifications in northeastern Egypt with Operation Moked, or Operation Focus. Two waves of Israeli Air Force attacks destroyed hundreds of Egypt's aircraft, most of which were not even able to take off, to achieve total air superiority. The success of the attack was made possible thanks to world-class training and effective ground crews. By 1035, Israeli Air Force Commander Moti Had told fellow Israelis that the Egyptian Air Force had ceased to exist. And this was certainly true, with more than 90% of all operational aircraft destroyed. Simultaneously, Israeli forces had wiped out the Jordanian Air Force and launched a three-pronged attack in the Sinai Peninsula. Israel's fight soon reached the Syrians in the Golan Heights by the third day, and Israel signed a ceasefire less than a week after going to war. Yitzhak Harbin, chief of staff of the IDF, named the conflict the Six-Day War, evoking the days of creation. In this project, we're going to analyze Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser and Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol to discover the role that each leader played in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and more specifically, the Six-Day War. There exist four major objectives of this educational video. First, we'll examine the personal characteristics and backgrounds of both Nasser and Eshkol and compare and contrast them. Then we'll investigate some of their patterns of foreign policy. Then we'll determine the role that each of these leaders played in this six-day war and determine whether or not there was internal or external coercion on behalf of their decision. And then we'll evaluate the contributions that each of these leaders made to conflict management post-war. Levi Eshkol was born in the Ukraine in 1895 and had a traditional Jewish upbringing. He graduated from a Hebrew high school and immigrated to the land of Israel when he was 18 years old, which at the time was part of the Ottoman Empire. The only way he felt he could serve his people was volunteering for the Jewish Legion of the British Army during World War I. Following his stint in the Jewish Legion, Eshkol became a political activist and established the Mekarot Water Company in 1937 and served as its director for 14 years, introducing irrigation to Israel and culminating in the ambitious National Water Carrier Project. As a member of the Haganah High Command, he served as Director General of the Ministry of Defense, where he laid the foundations for Israel's defense industries. He was then appointed Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Finance, Head of Settlement Division for the Jewish Agency, and Treasurer for the Jewish Agency, before finally becoming Prime Minister in 1963, when his mentor stepped down. Sticking to his military roots, Eshkol improved Israeli foreign relations and even made the first state visit of an Israeli PM to Washington, laying the foundation of a relationship between Americans and Israelis for decades to come. Now on to the Egyptian leader. Born in the suburbs of Alexandria, Egypt in 1918, Gamal Abdel Nasser received traditional schooling and became politically active at a young age. He was even jailed for participating in an anti-British demonstration as a teenager. At the age of 19, Nasser applied to the military academy. Though he was initially rejected, he eventually found his way to the military and served in Sudan throughout World War II. After some time, Gamal Nasser and a few dissident officers known as the Free Officers Movement would lead a bloodless coup in 1952 and assume control of Egypt from his fellow officers and newly appointed government leaders to establish single-party rule with himself at the helm. Nasser went on to gain popular support throughout the entire Arab community when he nationalized the Suez Canal. The response in the tripartite invasion from Israel, France, and Britain was met with criticism from the United States, and eventually the tripartite powers retreated, and this was interpreted as a victory for Egypt and the Arab community. So far, we've examined the background of both of these leaders, and we can see that the personal characteristics of President Nasser and Prime Minister Eshkol were at times comparable and contrasting. Both had traditional schooling, were responsible in some part for the prevailing governments of both nations, had a background in military, and even crafted liberal policies within their nation. However, the cultural difference between pan-Arabism and pro-Israel and a pro-Israel identity is one enough to create the conflict that would eventually spurn the Six-Day War. Now that we looked at the background of both Eshkol and Nasser, we're now going to look at the pattern of foreign policies of both leaders. And we'll begin with Nasser due to his longer reign. Contrary to Prime Minister Eshkol, President Nasser had a long history of crafting and implementing foreign policy, and he never really experienced severe internal dissent, as he emerged as the key figure behind pan-Arabism and attempted to create a united Arab Republic. President Gamal Nasser enjoyed enormous popularity in Egypt and the rest of the Arab community, and while that may usually give leaders a chance to be happy, he soon grew fearful of the weakness of his army and frequently turned towards the international community. 
Nasser, seen here working with Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, relied on the Soviet Union for both armaments and intelligence. And in 1967, the Soviets passed on intelligence that Israel was planning an attack on their northern border against Syria. And Syria, Jordan, and Nasser came together and decided that it was time for them to fortify their borders against Israel. Once they decided this, Nasser decided to call United Nations Secretary General Uthant and ask him to remove United Nations emergency forces. At this time, Nasser began to fortify his own border, and many of these Arabic countries thought that it would be a breeze to Tel Aviv. <laughs> In this speech to Arab trade unionists on May 26, 1967, Nasser announced that if Israel were to embark on an aggression against Syria or Egypt, their basic objective would be to destroy Israel. Although President Nasser wanted to remain defensive, such rhetoric threatened the balance of power in Israel. In fact, such feisty rhetoric pushed tensions to an all-time high, and Arabic countries were lining up to support Nasser. Although Prime Minister Levi Eshkol had little executive experience when it came to formulating foreign policy, he had to act soon and with the decision of his Joint Chiefs of Staff in order to prevent further fortification along Israel's borders. Keeping in line with his previous stances, Prime Minister Eshkol was reluctant to act without United States support. However, many members of the Israeli Defense Force felt that every day wasted on waiting for the United States was another day that Israel's security policy was continuing to fail. For example, Yitzhak Rabin, chief of staff of the IDF and future prime minister, even contemplated a situation where the government was so hesitant that the army would take decisions without the government's approval. Eventually, Eshkol succumbed to the pressure of the National Unity Government and fell victim to the IDF's pleas. However, the waiting period that had taken place had allowed both the Air Force and ground forces to adequately train and prepare for combat, which left them at an incredible advantage. But though, a swift victory for Israel gave rise to the belief that the newly formed state could not be destroyed. For Arab countries, the shock and scale of the sudden defeat came as a huge blow. Well, 1967 established the newly formed state as a first-class military power backed by powerful Western countries. Israel almost tripled its territory. On the 5th of June 1967, Israel launched an attack against Egypt, Syria and Jordan after Egyptian President Nasser declared his intention to strike Israel. Well, after six days of fighting, Israel had seized control of Jordan's West Bank, Syria's Golan Heights and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. Well, the Sinai was later returned to Egypt, while the West Bank, home to 2.4 million Palestinians, as well as the fertile Golan Heights, they both remain under occupation. Following Israel's decisive victory, Eshkol once again turned to the international community to further advance the forces of the IDF. However, Eshkol passed away in 1969 and left behind his position of power to some of the very generals that had helped convince him of an expansionist policy in 67. The day a ceasefire was reached in the Six Days War, Nasser resigned from his position as president of Egypt. However, millions throughout Egypt and the Arab community rejected his resignation and hoped that he would reclaim his position as president of Egypt and a leader of parent Arabism throughout the Middle East. With renewed public support, ne Nasser, much like Eshkol, turned his attention to the international community and looked for support from the Soviet Union. Eventually, the Soviet Union would replace more than half of the armaments that were lost by Egypt in the Six Days War, and eventually, Nasser would take these armaments and start another war with Israel, the War of Attrition, which he would continue to until his death. Unfortunately, both Nasser and Eshkol did little in terms of conflict management, and following the war, they simply rebuilt their forces and got ready for more conflicts between the two nations. Tomorrow never comes until it's too late, too late, too late.